Hello, and welcome back once again to Belmont Bunch. Uh, this is the Philly, Philly, Philly week, the Philly special week, if you will. Um, and that was pretty bad, but we're still going to kick it to James. James, how are you doing? Yes, I am great because we got, what, four, four out of to six, six points, points. Yeah. Um, Not bad. against Philly. And, mm. you know, that sounds like a Philly special to me. So right, that's the end of the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we are going to go over the first three games, the only three games that happened this week. They all were against Philly. And I would say, Tom, what do you think? Positive overall, me- mediocre, negative? What's like your one word overall? Um, meh. Meh. I, yeah. would, I would it- mostly agree. Yeah, only because you gave me only one word. If I had okay. a couple, if I had a few words, I'd say eh, it was fine. Okay, which is markedly different than meh. It's pretty much the same thing. I just say meh a lot. <laughs> yeah. So, okay, so first Philly game. What was the rundown? That was in the Coliseum. Yeah, not in Brooklyn. Uh, not in Brooklyn, as ESPN. The, yeah, uh, ESPN on their game page, uh, per usual. Uh, they've gotten this wrong. Uh, you know what? Uh, did they get this wrong? We'll go through it um, individually. But um, yeah, this game was not in Brooklyn, as advertised by ESPN. Uh, the Islanders had a very interesting outing in this first one. And it started off with probably. Um, well, not started off. First period was kind of meh. Um, the Isles didn't play well, uh, but they also uh, kind of were able to fall back on Varley having a decent period. Um, the second period was the second worst period of the season. The first, um, pretty safely, at least for now, is the Washington period where we gave up five yes. against a Washington team that didn't have OV and it didn't have like Backstrom. It's missing a bunch of guys and we still got annihilated. So that's probably going to stick as the worst period of the season, at least I hope, because uh, I don't want to see anything worse than that. But in this period. Oh, just you wait, Tom. Oh, God. <laughs> um, in this period, uh, Oscar Lindblom uh, scored uh scored once he scored three times against us in the three games. Um, and this was like totally deserved for the flyers. Uh, Lindblom got one. Giroux got one. Voracek got one not long after the Giroux one. And it wasn't really um, Varley's fault on really any of them. And Michael Dow Cole scores. And this is off of, you know, a good, a decent start to the period, but Michael Dow Cole rips one past Carter Hart, Carter Hart, who's really struggled this year. And so at that point, you're just like, oh, just pepper shots on this guy. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, that was the move because Sebastian Ajo, uh, just a few minutes later, rips one top corner. And Sebastian Ajo played very badly overall. You know, he scores, so everybody yells at me. But that doesn't mean that he played well defensively because he didn't. He had a couple of awful giveaways. And he really doesn't look like a, uh, you know, a type of defenseman that will survive Trotz's system because you need to be good defensively. Uh, and Sebastian Ajo is like basically a forward. <laughs> uh, by the way, Nick Letty assisted both of those goals that I just mentioned. Uh, and then Oliver Wallstrom scores this. Yes. And Nick Letty, who was my runner up uh, hot player of the week last week. Yeah. And he, he, he carried it into this week. Big. Time. Oh yeah, for sure. He was um, fantastic this week because that, that third assist was the best of, of the trio. Uh, so Letty has the puck kind of, you know, where the D-man usually hangs out, the top of his own zone. And the Flyers, you know, at this point, I think because of momentum, they're all, you know, a little bit nervous and they're not they're not playing a very smart game. And all three of them go straight to Letty. And it's like, all right, Letty just zips a pass through all of them to the back post and Wallstrom is able to just slam it in. And like, oh my God, that's with like five minutes left, close to five minutes left. And me and the Islanders, uh, we had different opinions on how the game should go the rest of the way because I immediately was like, lock it down, get the point, play the most defensive. You have earned the right to play the trot system. You scored three goals. Everybody complains you're not exciting. You scored three goals in a matter of seven minutes. Guess what? You have earned the right to bunker down and get OT because points are everything. And they don't because they kept going and, you know, a little bit to their credit, they, they got, you know, caught up in the moment um, and they almost did 
find a way to get a fourth, but that overexcitement to try to get a fourth instead of playing, you know, like a, a more heady trots like game leads um, uh, Scott Mayfield to try a seam pass that goes for a really bad, unnecessary icing. And then we lose the face off. And then Scott Mayfield loses his man. And Oscar Lindblom scores his second of the game with only like two and a half minutes left. So uh, undoubtedly, uh, Scott Mayfield cost them a point for sure. Um, he ices it and then he doesn't rotate to his man. Uh, and Mayfield, I really have liked in the past. I have not liked this game at all this year. I really wanted after that game, because uh, I think everybody knew lineup changes were going to happen regardless of the th- third period push. I wanted Thomas Hickey and I did get Thomas Hickey. Um, but, you know, it's, it's, it'll be interesting to see when Dobson gets back, what's going to happen. I don't know how many times you tweeted it, but after the game, you're like, was that Mayfield who iced it? Like, like I was just thinking of you as like an old man that was like, like who didn't hear the TV. Like, was that Mayfield? I couldn't see him. Like you like replied to several people's tweets and you were like, was that Mayfield? Like, I, like, I don't know if you were like being sarcastic or you actually just wanted to make sure. I really, cause you know what? I don't want to just get on a guy just, you know, especially not, you know, get, get it wrong too. Yeah. Well, pretty much, pretty much done with the first game. Basically it's just like, one of those real like punch in the gut type games. And yes. Yeah. yeah um, sure. Although I get the only thing uh, uh, left that I have to say um, is that a lot of people on Twitter afterwards were kind of like, that's worse than losing three, nothing. I would have rather them not show up in the third, but uh, hard yeah, that's probably that. easier. That's easier to say in the moment probably. Yeah. Uh, because it hurts more for them to come back and then blow it. But I mean, I think you saw in the next two games of the series, it at least got them going. It got the confidence up a mm-hmm. little bit because if you had lost three nothing to Philly and just gone to oh one and two against them, uh, even though they still went to oh one and two against them, but if you do that and you get shut out, um, I don't know. I feel like that's a different level of despair against Philly. But oh, yeah, showing sure. that fight, I think carried over to the next two games, especially to the second game. Yes, especially the second game. Yeah. All right. Segway. Uh, so Segway, game, Sam. <laughs> all right. So the second game, the Islanders win it six to one. Uh, one of the more, uh, it was a combination of one of their more complete efforts of the year and Philly just looking horrible. So I uh, should have mentioned it going into the first uh, game, but the, the Rangers beat Philly nine, nothing going into that first game. And the first game for us against Philly in this stretch. And so as a fan, I feel like you you probably knew there were only two outcomes, and they were Islanders, um, like Islanders lose. Well, the, the the outcomes are the Islanders lose or the Islanders yeah. win. Yeah. But I was I was trying to say. Wait, like, but what about the outcomes where the Flyers lose or the Flyers win? Yeah. Well, I was going to say that it feels like after after Philly loses nine nothing and then has to play a game within the next twenty four hours, you feel like they're either going to come out on fire just out of sheer like anger or they're going to get annihilated and there's no in between. But I think maybe I forgot to account for Philly came out on fire in the first two periods and then fatigue from playing two games and two nights Mm -hmm. set in, in the third, allowing the Islanders, you know, to control the third and still blow it. But um, anyway, the second game of the series uh, let's just check with ESPN. Oh, this game was also in Brooklyn, apparently, according to ESPN. So ESPN also a great job. Wait, so that means uh, that the deal. Islanders Coliseum record is still pristine. That, that's true. Yeah, then <laughs> according we didn't to ESPN. lose in regulation. Well, we yeah. haven't played a game at the Coliseum this year, according oh, to ESPN. Oh, wow. Uh, so it is 100%. pristine. Um, that's amazing. So this game, uh, the Isles, uh, just the the effort was immediately better. And I, they made a bunch of lineup changes. Uh, we got first <laughs> oh, line God, Leo. It was, it was wacky, dude. Yeah. Uh, we got first line Leo. Uh, which is the only one of these moves that sucks. <laughs> yep. uh, we got, um, uh, Del, uh, I think Del Cole. Yeah, he stayed in the lineup. He scored his yeah. first goal of the season. Uh, oh, generally, was, Del Cole oh, has been looking good. Game, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, Del Cole has been looking actually pretty good the last week. Um, we got Hickey in the lineup. Uh, I, I what was it. Ajo sat that game. Uh, and we got different defensive pairings a little bit. Um, and, oh, yeah. And I think, I yeah, Bellows came out for Leo. Um, and also Sorokin. I should mention uh, Sorokin 
Uh, yep. This was a big start for Sorokin. Uh, you kind of knew in a three-game series that Sorokin was at least going to get one. Um, and this game started off, it was just all Islanders. And this is, like I said, a little bit of Philly, a little bit of the Islanders. The Islanders came out on fire, and Philly just can't defend right now. Like, we were talking about it before the podcast, but I think they might just completely fall out of the playoff picture the way they're playing and, like, get Elaine Vigneault fired. But that is not for an Islander podcast. Um Jean-Gabriel Pajot gets a power play goal. This was a get well game for a lot of guys that hadn't scored in a while. They didn't waste any time. They get another two minutes later through Jordan Everly. Big net front scramble. Thomas Hickey does a great job. And I miss Thomas Hickey so much. As people know, uh, he was concussed and missed a lot of last year after getting sent down already. So he got concussed in Bridgeport. So obviously professionally tough year. Um, and he's also, you know, he was on a $2.5 million contract and you're playing in the minors. Uh, I'm sure that's not fun for a guy that, de- you know, definitely wants to play in the NHL. And he also lost his brother. Um, so really tough year for Thomas Hickey on and off the ice. And you got to see what it meant after the game. He had an, an amazing, uh, you know, uh, talk with the reporters and post game uh, about what it meant to him to get back on the ice. But he like based on merit alone, he was fantastic. And then on top of that, you, you know, you just feel amazing for him. He drove all the way around the net, threw it to the front. Islanders get uh, a lot of traffic in front. Barzal's in there whacking away. Leo Komarov is in there looking very confused. <laughs> and eventually the puck kicks out to Jordan Eberle, who roofs it. He gets his 10th. It's two nothing. He breaks a goal, uh, you know, a goalless drought. Uh, I think it was like, might have been like nine games for him. And so it's already three, nothing 10 minutes in and Casey Sezikis compounds it. Uh, He just rips the puck away from a defenseman uh, trying to exit the zone and just rips one by Carter Hart. Uh, Sezikis was unbelievable in this game. Um, He gets the two goals and he had incredible penalty killing. He was just skating incredibly. Uh, Now Adam Pellich had a rare faux pas falls down, uh, creates a two on one. And the Flyers do get one back, and there's a lot of game left, so you're a little bit nervous. The Islanders in the second period didn't play great, but they kind of, you know, rode uh, Elias Sorokin a little bit. Uh, they just pl- tried to play a simple period, succeed in getting out of it, still 4-1. And then in the third, they're able to continue, you know, just kind of clamping down on the game, not really looking for goals, but they would get gifted to uh, because uh, Beauvillier steals one. Uh, credit to him, he knocks the puck out of midair off a flyer attempted. Well, well, from what I remember from this one, Mm -hmm. it was, I forget which flyer it was. They were behind the net in their own zone. Yeah. Nelson poke checked it out of, out of that flyers possession. And then that's, that's like when I think that's when Bovillier kind of hit it out of midair. Well, it it actually started with the, the flyer player tried to just like, Roll the clip. We're gonna we're gonna play the clip. Insert the clip here. I remember this one pretty vividly. And then, I remember it vividly too. Each and every time. And the... Stolen away by Beauvillier. Score! And then Brock Nelson's gonna knock this one down in midair. And look at that, that little pass. Oh, that... Um... Anyway, Josh Bailey scored after that, <laughs> uh, and it was a similar. It was almost the same exact play. Carter Hart uh, behind his own net, down five one. Um, you know me questioning. Uh, his drive to compete in the NHL shoots the puck straight into Josh Bailey's chest and he just slams it into the empty net. Yeah, and that was man, so weird. It just like the Flyers turning into the Buffalo Sabres for a couple plays. Carter Hart is really interesting because I mean, he was so freaking solid in the playoffs last year. From what is that noise? Oh, that's the ESPN. ESPN got us again. I, I'm so done with them. Hey, they get the Phillies arena, right? Anyway, go ahead. Their we'll attendance was only on just under 3000. Uh, <laughs> can you, can you say a uh, bad fan base? Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, I'm pretty sure the Coliseum is what only letting in like 1500. Yeah, I guess. Yeah. I, I don't know. They didn't get the attendance right for the Islander game. Why do you use ESPN ever? <laughs> um, I don't know. <laughs> Um, I think I NHL, NHL. Sometimes I, I guess it, I think it's a little better uh, optically, like NHL UI, or UI. 
I think ESPN is better with UI, but NHL is better for information. Yeah. Going into the third game, um, I think a lot of people probably expected Semyon Varlamov. Now, Sorokin did a good job being the stopper, you know, uh, kind of getting the team a little bit of momentum back with that second win, uh, even though, you know, the Islanders just played a, a really good game as well. Elias Sorokin had to like win the game in this third game for the Islanders. It was one nothing through two, uh, but I think, you know, you're just kind of like, thank God it's only one nothing. Elias Sorokin's playing an excellent game. Um, and in the third, you get a decent push from the Islanders. Uh, they're able to tie it up through uh, Oliver Wallstrom, who scores his eighth of the year and just generally has been really strong recently. Um, and that comes from Pajo and Pelic. So uh, a nice little, you know, it, it kind of just fell to him. Uh, a little bit fortunate. Uh, Brian Elliott kind of didn't know where it was and he just slammed it home. Uh, and we do, we, before we go to OT, we take a penalty and it's one of the only, it, probably the only thing that Sorokin did wrong in the whole game where he has the, the odd um, bad rebound. Now he makes a save, but he kicks it right back out to the middle of the slot. And there's a flyer player standing right there. I think it was Couturier. Not sure exactly. I think it was Couturier. Um, and because of that, Letty is forced to hook, to hook him. Uh, because I think that's going to get scored otherwise. So that's one of those penalties that you don't really get angry at the player for. You're like, oh, mm -hmm. okay. Like that, you know, it's a goal or it's a penalty and you take the penalty. And that's a good penalty by Nick Letty, who really can't do any wrong right now. He keeps like, I keep heaping praise on him, but he keeps earning it and didn't have to make any saves in the OT because the Islanders kill the penalty. And as is the rule, it stays four on four until the next whistle. And that helped the Islanders because we're not the fastest team. So three on three doesn't benefit us four on four. We were able to even get our fourth line out there, which you don't usually do in overtime, but when it's four on four, you know, there's less room three on three. There's a lot more ice. There's a lot more open space. I remember and, you um, saying when I, you know, when first time I was probably watching an OT game, you were like, it's all about Corsi. It's all about puck <laughs> possession and stuff. And, you know, it's like, cause you'll even see a lot of times players skate out of the zone just to like, kind of make a good entry, whatever. Yeah. And uh, so in this game, there was so in the overtime, I felt like there was no cohesive strategy really for no, either team. It was a there was bit so many the overtone uh, or turnovers and stuff like that, you know, like way more than I feel like is normal to see in overtime, even well, though we have had some pretty wacky overtimes. Probably because you know? the ice with the fourth player out there for each team is a little bit more bunched. Oh up. yeah, for sure. Yeah. yeah. And I mean, like when's the last, like whoever practices four and four too, you know what I mean? Yeah. it's it, I, I'm sure they do, but I'm uh, it's, it's uh, a little bit more rare now because mm -hmm. overtime isn't that way. Uh, yeah. I mean, it still happens in regulation, but yeah. So I'm sure it does get. Oh practiced. yeah, duh. of course. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't think of that. <laughs> yeah, but um, but Beauvillier uh gets I think a, a dump in from Pajo and is able to you know sneak around uh Brian Elliott and uh, just barely get it off the skate and in. Uh, Beauvillier needed that. Um, That's the first Islanders. time I think I remember seeing a wraparound mm -hmm. goal actually work. Yeah, it's, it's normally pretty rare. that post like you think like the goalie would have plenty of time. And yeah. this is actually now that I'm remembering it normally has plenty of time to just push off the, you know, one post mm -hmm. and get to the other, but Elliot was kind of outside of his crease a little bit. Yeah. And uh, he, he did. Didn't I don't have think he post. recognized. Uh, I think the he played as it developed as quickly as he could. Yeah. Have. I think that was definitely part of it. But then I think even he probably would have had enough time to re react if he was just like literally maybe two inches back into his crease or like, not 39 years old. He's that old. No. He's around that. He's like 37 no. or something. Is no, he he's really old. old. He's like, he's very old. He's I have... he's been playing as long as I've been watching. Beauvillier is a great skater. Mm -hmm. Whether or not he's playing well, he's always skating well. Mm -hmm. And he just yeah, he just cuts it around the net, puts it in. And the Islanders steal a game because they didn't deserve it. <laughs> Ilya Sorokin did. Ilya Sorokin deserved that game. I didn't um, see, I didn't even like I, I was obviously watching the game, but I guess I wasn't really paying attention to the shots. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of times, like you see the attempted shots, you know, so it's like, yeah. so, like it looks like they're shooting a lot. Do you want to then... guess? Do you want to take a no? I, I remember guess? seeing when I saw the oh. recap that you made. It was, yeah. uh, it was what fourteen shots, uh, seventeen. Is that including overtime? Five. Thirty-seven to twenty. 
Oh, wait, but that's including our overtime shots, 20. Yeah, so it was yeah. 37 to 16 going into OT. We had all four that's shots in OT. insane. Yeah. Yeah, well, it just goes to show, well, first of all, how important it is to have a good tandem because yeah. uh, you don't yeah. want to overwork uh, Varley. And this this two-game stretch, by the way, I think is, you know, one of the biggest things for Sorokin's development is gaining the trust to play in big games. And, oh, my God, did he do that. Uh, he played excellent in both of these games, rebound control so much better, puck tracking so much better. Um, he's showing an ability to learn quickly from mistakes, uh, as evidenced by that shootout a couple weeks or last week, whenever the last recap was, against uh, the Devils where he gives up a goal on the first shootout attempt he's ever faced. And you're mm-hmm. like, immediately I was like, uh-oh, like we're going to lose. It's his first time. I'm not even going to blame him. But then he adjusted and made three straight saves. He seems to be kind of a quick learner. Um, and, you know, it, part of because he had to learn a lot about different angles, different, you know, uh, small things about the NHL that are different than the KHL. Yeah. And it feels like he's starting to master that because um, can I, oh, this could transition us right into. Well, let me just say youth. one thing. Let me just say one thing really quick about mm-hmm. that. I would sure. say I wouldn't be surprised in his case since he's been playing in the KHL for what, five years? Uh, he's been there for a while, probably maybe close to five. Cause, uh, but like, I would imagine not even he, I'm sure a million people told him on his way, you know, since he got, uh, since the rights, since the Islanders got the rights to him that he he knew he was going to go to the NHL. I'm sure people have been telling all the angles are different. Like, I'm sure everybody knows that, you know? Sure. Yeah. yeah. And so it's probably, it's just probably the muscle memory thing. I would think that's, that's always what I think is like, if you've, you know, I haven't even had a job for five years you know what i mean uh, like the longest job i've ever held down was probably three years mm-hmm. and like you know i think about how how much i learned about that stuff so it's like playing at a professional level like you just you can mentally know things but the muscle memory is just probably especially you know for an athlete it's yeah. hard to overcome yeah so now absolutely. it's like he's just like he's just i so, so i think the ceiling for him is like there's no ceiling it's just he's gonna stop everything it's just sky. A zero zero goals against average you know <laughs> but um he yeah, lives and- in a house with no roof because the ceiling is so <laughs> high. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, that's good. We should tweet that. Sure. Yeah. Um, by the way, it's really important that he is good. And this is going to transition us into the next section, which is uh, emerging youth on the team. Yes. Um, Elias Roken. Uh, he uh, has won eight straight starts and has played. He's like, it seems like, I I think it's important for people to know that progression is not linear. Guys are going to have bad games. Um, This isn't going to just keep going up. It's not stocks. It won't keep going (laughs) up. There will be, there will be a downturn. Um, But the consistency that he's been playing with and the fact that he's like improving noticeably uh, every start right now, his stats are 922 save percentage. 197 goals against now the 197 goals against i mean both of those stats i think people will say well he plays in an islander system and islanders insulate their goalies well because they don't give up a lot of high danger chances Mm -hmm. i mean but the last game against philly we did we gave up a decent (laughs) amount of chances we gave up 37 shots um and sorokin had to make some like big bailout saves he had a breakaway save in the first period that kept us in it uh and the, I, I forgot to mention the referees were not great. Uh, they missed like three they calls in the first three period calls long. in the first period. Yeah, that yeah, was that was pretty bad. I again, I don't know how often it is that, like, we, you know, obviously, like w- the announcers and we see it as a team, but then we kind of just ignore yeah the calls that should have gone against us. Mm-hmm. It, I, I'm sure it's, but that game felt very egregious. <laughs> the first yeah. period specifically, it was it was very bad, but very um, bad, very bad. But uh, yeah, Sorokin just. Really, uh, he he's playing incredibly well. Uh, expected goals against based on shots faced. I'm looking at some of the advanced analytics. Um, his power yeah, play save percentage stats, stats up yeah. here, right here. He's just he's just been generally good. I think the other day I saw he was like top ten in um, like high and wasn't maybe. I'm not sure if it was high danger chances against. He does have seven high danger scoring chances against 
out of uh, he's got like many. a 682 save percentage on high. Day. I have to see what the league average is on that. So yeah, I was uh, gonna say, yeah, it's so gotta I, be that's gotta be at least normal. I would think. Yeah, I'm still trying to get into um, some of those a little bit better for like skaters. For goalies, it's kind of Greek to me still. But yeah, um, I I think some of this stuff is actually surprisingly easier to uh, digest than than you would think. Um, but anyway, emerging youth, uh, Sorokin, uh, uh, emerging as, you know, a, a genuine one B recently means that Varumov won't have to start every game. Trotz is starting the show trust in Sorokin, which is big because I mean, Sorokin, first of all, is due a new contract, uh, next year, because, you know, to get him over here, we were just barely, you know, we had to sign him to a one year, 2 million, just like kind of show me deal. And guess what? He's doing a really good job so far. So we, he's going to. It's going to demand a payday and uh, we're going to have to also pay um, bars all in a few years. That's still a little, we were able to kick that can down the road, but we are going to have to sign like Bo next year. Uh, so th- there's cap stuff uh, going on and we'll get to that in our trade deadline thing in a minute. Uh, so Sorokin, I think I've said everything I want to say about him. He's just, uh, he's getting better every start. The angles are better. Uh, the rebound control generally is better. Um, the only thing I would say, and this is an off season thing, if he can maybe pack on a few pounds, um, Let's just see, to he's, fill, w- he's he, 190 pounds. Yeah. And he's six, so, three, uh, I'm heavier than him. And that makes me feel really <laughs> bad, but he, uh, he doesn't like, there's a lot of goalies in the league right now that are like big goalies that fill a lot of the net. And he doesn't really do that. He relies on his athleticism more. I would than, say his flexibility, if anything. Like yeah, he, yeah. Yeah. Which is, uh, you know, under athleticism, I suppose, mm-hmm. but yeah. Yeah, I mean, you got to see that the other night with that big glove save. Um, and yeah, I guess if he if he could get bigger and have it not affect his flexibility or athleticism too much, uh, I mean, he could be really, really dangerous. He's already very dangerous. He is 6'3", talk- yeah, so I, I do suppose. Mm-hmm. But I mean, like, I I wonder... But we need Are you going to be able to get we need big? Thick, we need, <laughs> yeah, we need thick. We need him to be there. girthier. But I mean, like... Right, because you you wouldn't want them to put on fat. You right, you'd want to put on muscle. Yeah, and yeah. it's like, could you really? Is it really re- that realistic to put on that much muscle that you, uh, you know, you gain like a shirt size of you know <laughs> you go from like a large to an extra large or whatever? Well, I I, I could do that without muscle, but <laughs> yeah. um, but see that will slow him down though. So it's like, mm-hmm. I mean, obviously there's always a sweet spot. Yeah, what, yeah, that's the other the, thing. Well, I was gonna say, what is the upside to him still? Like, when do you think he'll be like pretty much fully developed and and you know, like I, I kick think an ass. Goalies are. I think you have to be more patient with goalies than with skaters. I think skaters, you get a general idea of what they are like a few years before a goalie. Mm-hmm. Um, look at Carter Hart. Carter Hart's only like 22, yeah. and he's already played like three seasons, and he's gotten worse every year because the team is not doing a good job of insulating him. The good thing about Barry Trotz, among other things, is that. The he, only good thing about Barry Trotz. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. One of the 80,000 great things about Barry yeah. Trotz is that I think his system is so good for a goalie to get acclimated into because uh, they're not going to let you, you know, they let in this game, occasionally you're always going to have to bail out a team. That's part of the job description of, of, of goalie. Uh, but uh, Barry Trotz will minimize that. Um, that's part of the reason that Barry Trotz was so angry uh, the first two losses that Sorokin had because Sorokin, nobody in front of him played. Uh, mm-hmm. So when they have supported him, he has been excellent. So that just goes to show, you know, it's a team effort as well uh, for the Islanders to prevent a lot of high danger chances. Yeah. But to have a guy back there that can bail them out when necessary, to ha- I mean, two of them, because Varley, I don't want to leave Varley out. Varley course, can still yeah. do that. Um, it's huge. I mean, I talked about it the other day, but look how important Grice was in the playoffs last year. Grice was in goal for the game seven shutout against Philly. We had to go back and forth uh, between goalies because it's really difficult mentally. Uh, It's a difficult mental position to play uh, because you give up a couple goals and if they're not great, you can just get down on yourself and that can just compound so quickly. Look at Carter Hart again. Um, So it's really important in today's NHL to have, two good goalies. And so do you, uh, do you yeah. think if Carter Hart were traded or moved to a different team, you think, you know, not, not necessarily any team, but you know, a team that definitely had a better defense in front of him. Mm-hmm. 
you think you would start to see him get better? You think that's the main thing? I think that's one of the things, but like I said, the mental part of it is really difficult. So yeah. um, you might also just get to a point where you shatter a guy's confidence beyond repair. I Look, think that, that sounds maybe, so terrifying. Oh I know. God. I know it's already yeah. happened to me. Um, but, <laughs> ah, there you go. Sorry. You got me there. <laughs> yeah. Um, but like, I think with uh, maybe Matt Murray in Ottawa, who, mm-hmm. uh, who won two Stanley cups in his first two seasons and then uh, really struggled last year uh, and got traded to um, Ottawa and Ottawa was not a good landing spot for him because mm. in Pittsburgh, Pittsburgh didn't have great defense. Uh, but, you know, sometimes a great offense is a good defense because, you know, they, they would possess the puck so much that, oh, mm. they don't have to come to our end. They don't have the puck. Yeah. Right. Um, but now he's in Ottawa and he's expected to be the number one, whereas in Pittsburgh he had good backups. Oh, uh, yeah. And now he's the guy and he's really bad. And it's probably not all his fault, but you could also tell his confidence is just like gone. It's just gone. And I don't know how you get that back. They have like sports psychologists that do that i know mlb does that a lot baseball players get like what they call the yips which is just like i don't even know where the phrase comes from but it's basically like a mental block that like can turn into a mechanical issue with like your Uh, muscle memory like you were talking about earlier Um, oh yes and and it requires correction mentally and from uh you know a functional standpoint yeah so yeah i think um I think, I don't know. Carter Hart's still young enough that I don't think he's there. But uh, hopefully, don't not, let yeah. don't let him get there. I don't want to see. Yeah, exactly. Right. Like, of mm. course, I want to. I want the Islanders to pulverize the Flyers every chance they get. Yeah. But at the same time, it's like it's not heartbreaking yet. But like, it is. It just sucks to see like such a prominent. It's heartbreaking against everyone like but us. At the time, at the time of playing. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You know. Um. But actually, what's interesting, I I think, I don't remember. If, uh, it was referred to as the yips, but I think it was Malcolm Gladwell wrote a, hmm. uh, in one of his books talked about it and sports psychologists. It's um, when a, a, something like a motor skill is so that you do all the time. Like a lot of times it would happen. It happens mm-hmm. with tennis players when they serve the ball, the way they serve the ball. It's like such this, like, you know, it's like depending on however they do it, it's individual on each player. Um, they can just like, it becomes such muscle memory that they don't remember how like the actual motions it's just cause they, since they always do it. So whenever they, mm-hmm. when they actually try to figure it out, they like break it, you know, cause it's like almost like asking us like the, the analogy is like, if you ask a centipede, which leg does it move first, it won't be able to move <laughs> anymore, you know? Uh-huh. Um, so uh, yeah, it's like a big thing in sports psychology that I have come across before. I know sports. Sure. Um, yeah. Hey, that, <laughs> I mean, that sounds like exactly, you know, what, what goalies go through. Yeah. It's got to, because I mean, your, 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 your entire, you know, job is reaction time, mm-hmm. you know? So it's like, you don't, there's no way you have time to think when yeah. a puck's coming at you, but yeah. anyway, so yeah. So we talked about Ilya <clears throat> Sorokin and another young emerging yes, guy, um, Carter Hart. Um, so, but back to the other emerging guys from the Islanders. Yeah. Uh, so the other I'm one, I was guess, wait, let me guess, I'm going to guess Wallstrom. Yes. Okay. That was easy. Um, Wallstrom uh, has 15 points in 26 games this year. And he's basically won, he's won a job on the team. Like um, I think we went into the year uh, because, uh, you know, cap was tight knowing that we were going to have to play some kids. And I was excited for that. Cause mm-hmm. I don't, I think Lou Lamorello likes to play some old grizzled vets and him being kind of forced because of like circumstance to play kids has been fun because <laughs> yeah. Barry Trotz, Barry Trotz, of course, Dobson has developed pretty well um, because Barry Trotz is a good defensive. He's been coach. invisible in the ice, bro. He's... <laughs> <laughs> oh, <Sorry>. well, we, <laughs> yeah, let's sorry. hope he's okay. Um, yes, of course. But, um, you know, uh, in terms of I, in, in the beginning of the year, when people were a little like for the first time in a while, they're a little bit down on Barry. They started going, look at Wallstrom. Look at the fact that Bellows isn't playing. Um, Bo has been struggling. Um, Like maybe Barry doesn't develop offensive talent that well, but it looks like it's more like getting those players to buy into a, you know, a system where they have to play offense and defense. 
uh, Oliver Wallstrom has not only been good offensively and added, like when he started getting going, the power play, like he, he was able to take it, take it off. Mm -hmm. There was a weird phrasing of that, but um, 15 points in 26 games for a rookie is pretty good. Uh, He only had nine games of NHL experience prior to that. And he didn't have a single point. So this is, I, I actually, this, I, I forgive me for not remembering. So did he start the season? In the um, lineup? Yeah, I, I, I want to say, oh, I, I don't not, know. Maybe I wasn't he, consistent. In the I know lineup? he started know. the year on the team and I know because of like roster weird stuff, yeah. he gets like after every game, he gets sent down to the taxi squad, but it's just like a paper move. Oh, weird. I need, yeah, it's a weird. Like that literally happens after every game. Not literally every game, oh, but a okay. lot. That's um, surprising. It, it's got, it's got to be some sort of contract thing. Yeah. But um, he uh, has an unbelievable shot. First off, we saw that in the shootout um, against the Devils. It looked like the goalie had no chance of stopping that. Mm-hmm. And that came, that wasn't even, you know, the breakout moment. Um, he just has this shot we've known about it that's part of the reason he was drafted in the first round 11th overall and you know who was taken 12th overall Noah Dobson so that they're like a package um and the fact that both of them are becoming regulars um tells you that you could calm down about any worries about Barry Trotz getting the young guys going also just want to point out uh to make everyone feel old uh Oliver Walkstrom was born in 2000 Whoa. Yeah, he is. Yeah, I have his page up right here. He is 20 and years old. He is an American. He is yes. from Quincy, Massachusetts. That's cool. Yeah. Um, it's, yeah, yeah. Um, so he, um, I guess, less to say because, like, some, you know, uh, it's pretty evident that he's, pre- that he's yeah, pretty you know, evident. His yeah. shot's been great. Um, I guess one of the only non evident things is that he's actually got like 40 hits on the year, too. I, so something you else expect I, that out of a sniper. He so his he's two hundred and five pounds, mm-hmm. he, and he's being six two. So he's definitely got he's bulky for yeah, he's, a, he's for got, especially he's younger guys. Size. Yeah, and he was he fought Lindblom in the last yeah. game. That That's was the third a good game. Point. Right? Yeah, like you would game. never have expected that fight. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, not at all. And actually, now I'm curious how big Lindblom is because uh, I'm just curious. Yeah, and I would guess he's about the. I, if I had to guess, he looks probably about, about the same. So he's 6'1 and 191. So okay, so about the same height, a but a little bit. Size. bit he's like 15 pounds lighter. Yeah. So Wallstrom, um, by the way, in that fight, stopped for a second and said, What are you doing? Because Lindblom was kind of just like covering his head. It was really funny. Yeah, that was that was very unexpected. Like I, I almost missed it because I was just like, like I yeah, just yeah. was not expecting that at all. And um, I yeah, yeah, but anyway, moving on. Okay. Any and, other and, emerging and youths? Um, th- those are the two I wanted to spotlight. Well, you know, I think this could be a section that we keep talking about if Bellows comes back and Dobson, uh, you know, checking in on both of those guys. But I am very curious about how Bellows is going to develop. Like mm-hmm. it's, I guess, cause he's been, I think he's been really like streaky. Okay. Like he's been mm-hmm. like, like, I don't want to say he's been bad at all, you know, but um, like, I feel like he has, I feel like his upside is, is pretty big. There's yeah, a lot of potential, well, I suppose, over like I don't feel like he's gonna be streaky forever. I don't you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. I feel like he's still like squarely in the learning, developing. Like I mean, yeah, yeah. he's 20, right? So yeah, and, and look, the expectations trot trots has high expectations on mm-hmm. players. And um, you know, uh I think it definitely helps uh him it, it helps him that uh he got called out by Barry after you know not having a, a few good games and getting sent down. Yep. But the fact that he came right back and scored three goals in three games mm-hmm. was, was a nice response. Um, it's about consistency with bellows. And I think um, maybe they were, maybe they're trying to mold him into an Anders Lee type because that is uh, necessary at the moment. And uh, you know, we'll talk about that in a second with the trade deadline stuff. All right. Um, by the way, Ky- um, actually no, I'll save it for the trade deadline. All right, so you want to talk about the trade deadline, Tom? Yeah, all right. <laughs> yeah, all right, yeah. Okay, cool. first up, and I just noticed this and I uh, because um, this is the first thing, the first player I'm going to talk about for possibility of trade only because I was on their hockey reference page and I realized they are a local. Kyle Palmieri of the New Jersey Devils uh, has played for Lou Lamorello, I believe, as a GM before. Um, 
and just feels like the kind of guy that Lou would like because he's a two-way player, so you don't really have to get him to buy in. He's kind of there already. Mm-hmm. He uh, Historically, he's got 108 goal, 180 goals in his career in 589 games. Um, whereas his Corsi number uh, this year is about average. Um, so that's basically just saying that does your team have 50 is average um, out of 100. And he's at 50.8, so he's pretty average. Uh, Anything above 50 means your team gets more shots when you're on the ice than they give up. Below that is bad. Um, That means Mm -hmm. your your team gives up more. So it basically talks about how good of a possession player you are. Paul Mary's kind of in the middle. Uh, We'll talk about that with a couple of players. Paul Mary's having kind of a down year, but that's partly because the Devils don't really score a ton. He did score tonight. He now has six goals and nine assists. So he only has 15 points and now 29 games. Um, he's from Smithtown, New York. So that was wow. something I wanted to point out. And um, he he's having a down year, but um, maybe that would help the trade value. It lowers his trade value and maybe helps the Islanders in negotiations. Um, so that's my first option. Wait, uh, just yeah. so I can get him on screen. Who is he playing for right now? Uh, Jersey Devils. What's his name? Paul Mary? Kyle Paul Mary. Kyle Paul. How do you spell his last name? Uh P A L M. Oh, Paul Mary is his last name. Oh, yeah. The... <laughs> ah, I found him. Found yeah. him. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I thought his last name was Mary. <laughs> for an M. Oh, you thought it was Paul Mary. Yeah. Yep, yep, yep. Okay. No, I didn't. That would be stupid, Tom. <laughs> All right. Anyway. So um, so that's yeah. him. Okay. Uh, my other option, uh, somebody that was kind of rumored a little bit today, or, or, or sorry, this week has been rumored this week, um, Ricard Raquel. Uh, he plays in Anaheim. Uh, his Corsi numbers are pretty good. He's, he's at 51.9. Uh, he has played in 33 games. He has 21 points. That is especially not bad considering uh, that that team can't score. <laughs> so the point totals are going to be a little bit depressed out of Anaheim right now um so that's not bad uh I think the Islanders are maybe looking a little bit more for a goal scorer and the fact that they only six goals and I feel like they're this they're perpetually looking for a goal scorer yeah yeah and uh wait, so Raquel, wait, who was sorry Raquel that was yeah, who it was Ricard Raquel okay and uh Raquel is. um he's on a good contract though and and also this is something that has to be taken into account is so cap hit the Islanders have uh, with Anders Lee going on the IR, who makes seven million, I think they have a little bit over seven million that they can fill in for this year. But you have to remember that Anders Lee is expected to be fine for the start of next year. And if you trade for a player that still has contract term next year, you're gonna have to get rid of money in the off season, which means you're gonna have to trade a player. So I think ideally the Islanders want a rental. Uh, I yeah. think in a year where the draft is gonna be a crapshoot because it's not expected to be as great a draft class and, or it's not as star studded one and two also um, barely anybody like because of COVID players haven't been able to play like junior players. So I think mm. scouting's going to be all over the place this year. I think if I don't think it hurts to trade your first round pick this year, as much as it would in other years. Um, so Ricard Raquel is another option. Good Corsi. I believe he's under contract for one more year after this. So that's a little bit of a downside, but the upside is he's only making 3.8 million and he's a good player. So that's a pretty nice contract and you wouldn't have to get rid of a ton in the off season. You'd probably have to get rid of Hickey, um, but we'll see. Well, you, you just know, praise. Yeah. So maybe we'll, we'll have to see how, sh- how stuff shakes out. And I'm sure, you know, Andrew Ladd, some, you know, a lot of people, everybody wants him gone. Uh, yes. But maybe it, uh, maybe Seattle will take him. Well, the tough thing is like to get rid of, you know, you have to add a sweetener to get rid of, a, uh, you know, a contract like Andrew Ladd. Mm-hmm. I don't want to say a guy like him. <laughs> the, this isn't an <laughs> indictment an on person. Andrew Ladd. No, yeah. no, no, of course. Um, but you're going to like, it's kind of tough because we're probably going to need our first round pick to trade for a guy. But like, if you want to get rid of Vlad, you're going to need to give up a first round pick right. for his bad con. So you yeah. got to choose. And I think it's more important in the now to get a scorer for this year. 
Um, because you're playing for the cup. You're a good team. You're like second place in the NHL right now. That being said, third, my third option for free uh, for trade um, is Taylor Hall. Now, this is the sexy one. This is the one everybody wants to talk about. He's on a one-year, $8 million deal. What does that mean? Most of that $8 million has already been uh, given to him because he has played the majority of the, the year. And it's only a one-year deal, so he's a rental. So it fits the rental requirement. Mm. It fits the goal scorer, although he only has two goals this year. But he is on the Sabres, so that's like uh, yeah. that's like second on the team. No, it's not. Um, but he, ha- he only has 16 points in 30 games. But, and I know this is the part where some people might groan, his advanced stats say that he has actually still been really good, and mm. he just plays with a bunch of really bad players. So he has a Corsi of 53. That is very nice. It's not, it's not 69 nice, but it is very good, 53. Um, so yes, yes, yes. It, it, it hits the, it won't screw you next year. It hits the, uh, he's playing bad, so it'll help you in, in, in the negotiation, uh, the trade negotiation. And uh, he's going to get, he might get a little bit undervalued. Now, his name value is high, but he's not, he doesn't have the counting stats that everybody likes. He only has 16 points in 30 games. He, he was an MVP once upon a time. Uh, his advanced stats say that he's been good. And if he plays alongside Barzal and Eberly, I think he's going to be good. Uh, so that is yeah. kind of my favorite pick. Um, we have two more. Philip oh Forsberg. Philip Forsberg is making $6 million a year. Wait, he what has, team I, is that? Uh, the Predators, Nashville. Um, now, Philip Forsberg, the downside, he has another year left on his deal. Uh, and he's uh, making $6 million. So you would have to get rid of like $6 million in the offseason. So you'd basically have to trade Pajo. And I don't think we want to. Nah, yeah, yeah. I don't nobody think would allow that. I don't think we'd want to do that. So that almost. The fan base would erupt. I think that almost immediately starts to discount. And it's tough because he's 26 too. So he's in his prime. So you, oh, he's, and he's really good. He's got 11 goals and 17 assists um, going into tonight. Let me see if he scored tonight. Uh, he did not. All right. So he has 11 goals, 17 assists. He's got 28 points in 32 games on a bad team. And his advanced numbers, uh, his course, he is 54. So it's even better than Hall's. The only thing that hurts is that his contract is um, for another year after this. So you're going to, if you trade for him, you have to get rid of Andrew Ladd in the off season. And now that other teams are going to know how desperate you would be to get rid of Ladd. Yeah. That price is going to go even further. Might cost next year's first rounder because we're going to have to trade this year's first rounder to get Forsberg in this scenario. So this one is I mean, probably the best did. player, the best yeah. fit, um, like the best, the best package, total package as a player. The only downside is the financial, but it's a big financial downside. I mean, I was going to say the, like there could be a one over our one whole trade deal that takes care of that. So it's like, it's, you know, it's lad for Forsberg, but we also give them a first round pick and like a second round pick or whatever. Yeah. You know? And that's like tough. That, Cause I don't know if that'd be worth it, but that, that the tough thing is like constantly trading. Now we do have two second round picks in this year and next year from the Devontae's trade. So it gives you more hmm. draft capital, which gives you an opportunity to maybe get rid of Andrew Ladd. And Seattle is probably the move for that because, you know, yeah. a team is coming into the league with zero cap. So they can afford Andrew Ladd for like two or three more years um, and just bury him in the minors. Yeah. So um, my final option, and this is not somebody that I actually want. Uh, this is somebody that was mentioned today as a possibility um, by – someone of very great stature, which is uh, Elliot Friedman uh, of, uh, I think he's not TSN, the other one, that, that, that'd be a big mistake, of Sportsnet uh, in Canada. So Dustin Brown, he is a 36-year-old, so that's a little bit of a downside, uh, but he, he has leadership qualities. He's the captain, uh, or he, ha- he was the captain. He had it stripped. Um, he was the captain in L.A. for a long time. He's still in L.A., even at 36 years old, he has 14 goals this year. And he plays somewhat of a heavy Anders Lee-like game. So that's where 36, I think that's... though. Yeah. 
So, and I want to say uh, that is where, and I think he has another year in his deal uh, and he's making close to 6 million or that's his current cap. It says current salary for current cap hit 5.8 million. That's a lot. And I think if you're going to, if you're going to take that financial plunge, you're just going to get Philip Forsberg. You're going to get the guy that's 13 years younger. Yeah, that makes if you're, sense. If you're going to, so I think a lot of people immediately, even though this is a very real source, uh, Elliot Friedman, he's maybe the number one source in hockey media right now. Um, I get where he's coming from. Dustin Brown's having a good year on a team that is, you know, middle of the pack um, and is in a rebuild. So they're probably trying to get rid of cap, but at the same time, I think he's been, he's been a King his whole career. He's won two Stanley cups there. It kind of is like one of those. We're just going to hold on to you because of loyalty type. I mean, mean, we kind of, kind of do that with Andy green though. Kind of. It's not the same thing. Like he didn't yeah. have any title, he didn't have any cups with New Jersey. Mm-hmm. But yeah, no, you know, no, no. like if you know you're not, if you know your, your shots at winning the cup are are basically yeah. very small with the mm-hmm. team, right? Like, yeah, like the Kings are not going to win the cup this year. Right. Um, but, uh, imagine, watch them win the cup. <laughs> watch them yeah. come back. But uh, you also never, yeah, I, I guess, you know what? They, they won the Stanley Cup as an eight seed before. So, they're the exact wrong team for me to pick on with that. <laughs> um, but uh, he is also from New York. He's from Ithaca, though. Somebody pointed out, oh, or I think Elliot Friedman. Um, and this is probably, a, you know, he's from Canada. Maybe there's a little bit of a disconnect. He's like, he's from New York. There's a connection. But he's from Ithaca. Like, he'd be a safe. Nothing wrong with it. So I don't think there's as but I mean, yeah. I don't think anybody's converting to being a Sabre fan right now. Though, so. Not right now. <laughs> yeah. <you know>. Um, <laughs> But if there anyway, was ever a time to switch, it would be now. Yeah. Anyway, anyway, those those are the options. We said Dustin Brown, Philip Forsberg, Taylor Hall, Ricard Raquel, Kyle Palmieri. I posited um, jokingly the other day, um, uh, Broussard, because he had a hat trick. Uh, he hasn't had a great season. I think if they wanted to bring in Broussard, it would just be – it would have to be like for like a fourth round, fifth round pick, like a very late pick. And if we're using all these picks on like, if we end up going for a Forsberg and get, and getting rid of Vlad uh, using draft capital, there's no way we're going to waste, you know, a later round pick to get Broussard when, you know, Michael Dow Cole or, you know, ov- obviously offensively, there might be a little bit more there with Broussard, but Dow Cole has played better recently offensively. And um, Bellows is always there for you to use. Um We'll have to see. That's one of those moves that would be a depth move after you make the big move anyway. So I guess we got to face this first um, because it, you know, the way that Lou is speaking actually sounds like he's going to go out and get a top six forward. So kind of excited, kind of nervous. Um, but yeah, it's like a nervous excitement. So what do you think the, like if you had to take a, just a guess on actual percentage that a trade will be made, what would you guess? I would do you know, usually with the Islanders, just because in just the past, it's Lou, yeah, you would think well, it's low. The Islanders have been gun shy as a franchise uh, with some of these trades. But I think Lou, I think he's going to make a trade. I think it's like 80% chance that he trades for uh, a top six forward because um, I think he is getting the feeling too that this is a, wow, we're really good. Like we have a mm-hmm. shot at this. And if we're doing this with Leo Komarov on the top line, imagine what we could do with Philip Forsberg or Taylor Hall or Ricard Raquel or so-and-so on the top line. So, yeah. Um, yeah. So I, I think this is a part of being a GM is identifying the year to go all in. I think this is it. The, this team is gi- like, sometimes they talk about like, Oh, this team isn't even giving you anything. Like last year, Toronto went into the trade deadline losing to the Zamboni driver yeah. from Carolina. Mm-hmm. And the GM basically said, like, the team doesn't deserve reinforcements. Like, they're, why would I give up assets for a team that doesn't look like they care? Basically is what he said. Um, and this year's Islander team is giving you, you know, the go-ahead. They're like, hey, guess what? We're really good. Yeah. Um, like, if we had, like, an adequate extra weapon, mm-hmm. you know, it's like that's that'll we push could us be over. Cup the, yeah. Yeah, like that – 
Because I think, um, and this somebody spoke about this the other day. I think Brendan Burke had retweeted a Sportsnet article that said, "Oh, look at the surprising Islanders," and he was like, "It's not surprising. This is the third straight year they've been really good." Um, but um, I think even Islander fans would probably hesitate right now to say they're a cup contender. I won't. I we're a cup contender. I'll say it because I'm a lunatic. But I think most fans uh, are still kind of like, "Yeah, well, they're very, very, very good." But I don't know if they're cup contenders. If they make this move, I think it puts them over to cup contender uh, ter- territory. If they get one of these top six guys. Yeah. Um, and, you know, in the Taylor Hall scenario, it's perfect because it doesn't even affect you next year. Um, and in the Forsberg scenario, you, you got to, you know, you know that it's going to require changes in the off season, but if you win a cup, it's worth it. I agree. Oh I, yeah. Right. Yeah, it's like everything. Every sin is forgiven. Yeah, if you like, if you come out on top, absolutely. That like that winning a cup basically gives you like ten years of goodwill. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You could miss the playoffs it's every like... year after that for a long time. <laughs> All right, everyone. So the upcoming schedule is pretty easy. Um, we have a, a game that was supposed to be played tonight canceled. Um, I don't think we're gonna play the Boston game on uh, Thursday. I believe. It is. Uh, so I don't think we'll have a game until the Pittsburgh game. Uh, so that's the upcoming schedule. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, and obviously you'll be able to tell by the recap. And that's Pittsburgh back to back. Yeah. Or, you know, with a day in between, but twice mm-hmm. in a row. So yep. some, some good tests coming up because they're going to be playing some teams again that they've struggled with. So guess what? Uh, more opportunities to, uh, you know, get the monkey off the back. Yep. All right. Okay. Hot or not. Hot or not. Do you want to start? No. Okay. Um, my hot player of the week, uh, Elias Roken. Um, pretty easy. Uh, I don't even think I'm going to expand on it. We talked about him plenty in this episode. Um, not player of the week. Uh, a little bit harder. Um, I think I'm going to go back to the well <laughs> and go with Scott Mayfield. <laughs> um, I was. Uh, it okay. probably could be joint with maybe Sebastian Ajo I know he scored the goal but he's just like otherwise I don't think he's been very good defensively what about you I would say hot player of the week Wallstrom I I know like he you know a little bit maybe of a obvious answer but I just like he's been he scored really key goals this week so and I know I almost was expecting it which is like not good it's good and not good that's really that's a sign that the confidence that you know my confidence as a fan, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, which is really the most important confidence in the, yes. the players, uh, is uh, was I was like he's get like he's gonna if he's in front of the net or at least whatever like has opportunities chances whatever like I I'm pretty confident he'll he'll capitalize on it. Well, that's but a good not sign. player on the week. I was I was thinking about Mayfield. I don't think I'm gonna go Mayfield. Um, I don't think I'm gonna go Mayfield but I, I think I'm going to go Mayfield. Yeah, <laughs> come, to the, come to the dark side. Yeah, it's or like, I think I was, he was my not player. He's been on and off as the not player. And and again, it's it's kind of like a little unfair because a lot of the players are playing really well. Mm-hmm. And so it's like he's for, he has been definitely having a bad season. Yeah, yeah. I, I think he would probably agree with you. <laughs> yeah, um, but like, but a bad season in a good year versus, you know, so it's like the mistakes aren't, don't tend to be as bad it's led to some uh, unfortunate fewer goals. penalties maybe that's why maybe because he's transferred it, them over to bad play no but <laughs> if, if think about it like he might be instead of making bad penalties taking bad he's just letting them score instead well yeah right like he, he's <laughs> like no there might actually be something there man i don't know so i think i i don't think it's like a discipline issue or uh, or anything with mayfield I, it might just, I, I honestly think a little bit has to do with just bad luck on his part um and maybe just not the smartest plays yeah you know but All right. um around the league in yes. 60 seconds the return seconds. i the think return. i have a shot this week i think i have a shot i don't think you do <laughs> i think you're screwed right. oh right. i dropped my i caught the phone midair all right wow i'm ready impressive i got the okay. teams lined up so, ready. actually wait let me let me pull up that all all are you gonna do by how are you gonna do it? Like I'm gonna go by, by division. division. Yeah, okay. I got it set up on my phone. Divisions. Let's see. By division, like in standings, like you're just looking at the standings. Yeah, I got the NHL oh. app up. 
I have the ESPN app up. Oh, uh, website. yours is going to be all wrong. It's <laughs> yeah. going to say the Islanders are all last and the Rangers are in first. Okay. So we, which order? Central? It goes central, east, north, east west. west, north. West, north. It like changes daily too. Sometimes these, That's weird. I don't know why. Anyway. Whatever. I, I'm ready. Okay. So I'm going to have the camera for the thing, for the people. Yep. For the people. The people need the time. All right. Ready? Yes. Three, two, one, go. Tampa is going to win the cup. Carolina is excellent, excellent, excellent. Um, Florida, Florida is making me a believer. Uh, Chicago really falling apart. That four seed is loose. Uh, Columbus get better defensively. Nashville, you're done. Dallas start playing games again. Detroit better luck next year. Islanders keep it going. Washington. Fantastic. Uh, Pittsburgh, a little bit of a rut. Got to start beating the devils made fun of the Islanders for, for beating the devils. Boston, uh, start playing games again. Get healthy. Philly, stop giving up goals. Watch uh, the Rangers. Keep playing Washington. Uh, Jersey, keep playing Pittsburgh. Uh, Buffalo, stop playing. Um, ah, I'm only halfway through. Come um, on. Vegas. <laughs> you can do Vegas it. is going to win the West. Uh, Colorado, looks really good. I miss you, Taze. Minnesota, uh, downturn recently. Capo Kakinen's awesome. Uh, uh, St. Louis, uh, kind of just all right. Uh, L.A., good year. Arizona, meh. San Jose, ugh. Arizona, I mean, An- Anaheim, ugh. Tor- I'm a division off. Toronto, uh, Jack Campbell's your starter. Uh, Edmonton, keep going. You're getting it done. Maybe get a goalie. Uh, Winnipeg, uh, wake up a little bit. Help Connor Hellebuck. Uh, Montreal, um, I don't know what to say about Montreal. Vancouver, trade everyone. Calgary, trade everyone. Ottawa, better luck next year. That's it. All right, minute 23. So Dude, you gave up after the minute pass. No, allowed. I didn't. No, no, no I, I consciously conduct. didn't do that because I know last week you said that I gave up. I, um, I just so you know, just so you, you know. also didn't answer every team because you said you didn't know what to say about the Canadians. So, <laughs> well, that's that, that was actually a statement. On, that was a statement on how mediocre they've been. Oh, uh, okay, all right, yeah. that's fair. Good comeback. Um, Good save. So, I just want to point out though, 30, <laughs> 31 teams. It's a lot of teams. Not, that's not bad. It's not bad. It's but like we're at the NHL level here, you know what I mean? Like we're not in the minor leagues anymore, Tom. Well, I'm right. on the taxi squad. I'm in between. <laughs> oh, okay, all right. That you know that's fair. Sorry, didn't realize. Yeah. Um, but you know that was probably the best so far. The first week was the best, but you didn't get every team. You just you you know you just did a few from each division. Yeah. So you know, but it was a warm up. You know what I mean? It was a get warm well. up. I'm sweating. I'm physically warmed up. <laughs> um, and so yeah, so one one of these days, man. And then we're going to turn it's the tables. Never, I don't know if I'm it's physically to do it, possible. I'm not going to know anything. There's 31 teams like in 60 just under seconds. Two seconds per team. I have time for a word. And if I get stuck, it's over. Yep. <laughs> if I get much. stuck once, it's over. Does that, did you ever have like those multiplication quizzes in like third, second or third? Grade? Yeah. Yeah, dude, those would freak me out for that reason. Mm-hmm. We had like, we had one, uh, whatever, like 30 seconds to do 10 questions. Yeah. And 10 multiplication. Like, I wasn't a fan of that because at what three point seconds, your, question. like in a, what, what life scenario is that helping you with? Are you going to be at work one day and they're like, yeah. you have five seconds and your boss is like five, four, <laughs> three, two. And you're you like, have oh, 60 oh, seconds to answer. Eight all times the three. <laughs> like, uh, I yeah. just think that's really, Oh no, yeah. It would just stress me out. Yeah. And, uh, oh, uh, go. Anyway, I have a date with, 7 Eleven. Destiny. Okay. That too. Uh that's great. That is great. Tom, thank you for joining it's me. It's not great. You should help me. <laughs> on this, on this wonderful, wonderfully long uh weekly wrap up yep. about the Islanders. Yep. And the Flyers. Arguably, yes, and the Flyers. Arguably the best hockey team, the Islanders, you know. Not arguably. Ever. You also, one thing, one last thing I would like to add is, was it two weeks ago? You were like, yeah, like you were just said to me in casual conversation, you're like, yeah, I'm just going to win the cup. And I was like, no, <gasps> you can't say that. Yeah. You know, like you can't just say that out of nowhere. And they were in the middle of the non That is true. That was before they lost uh, to the Caps. And I did just say that Tampa Bay is going to win the cup in my recap. Well, that's because we want to jinx that. So. Well, I kind of think they're just going to actually <laughs> <laughs> I think um, there's a real possibility that now again I don't really 
the playoff system is weird this year because you're playing the first two rounds in your own division, and I don't really know how it goes after that. But I like I could see the Islanders and Tampa being the best two teams in the East again, and uh, Vegas winning the West. And uh, cool. yeah, yeah. <laughs> all right. Thank you very much for watching. That's gonna all be cut out. I'm sure. Yeah. I'm sure I won't leave any of this in. All right. I'm gonna stop recording now. Bye. Did we have a defined ending? <laughs> nope. <laughs>